on the site the Electro Brewery sits in now, in 1893, the first iteration was born. A brewery was formed. And inside this brewery, a Latro spirit. This brewery was called the Latro Brewing Company and it operated independently from 1893 to 1899. In 1899, the Latro Brewing Company, 19 other local competitors, and chief competitor, the Pittsburgh Brewing Company out of Pittsburgh, merged together to form the Pittsburgh Brewing Company. This new brewing company, with its 21 new branches, was able to service Western Pennsylvania. Previous branches who were spending time rivaling each other and fighting were now becoming profitable while working together. Their beer was being sold. With this merger, Pittsburgh Brewing Company was the largest in Pennsylvania. It created a environment where breweries didn't have to fail. They could join the conglomerate, they could join the merger, and they could survive. Because of the Pittsburgh Brewing Company, and because of their chief beer, Iron City, Latrobe was able to continue production. Latrobe was able to continue production through to 1920. With this merger, Iron City and Pittsburgh Brewing Company helped Latrobe and allowed Latrobe to continue brewing beer well into 1920. A favor and a help that Latrobe will soon not forget. These good times came to an end in 1919 with the ratification of the 18th Amendment and early 1920 with the passing of the Volstead Act. The manufacture, sale, and transport of alcohol in America was now illegal. And with it, factories closed, breweries closed, companies failed, men lost their jobs. At the very beginning of Prohibition, uh, my grandfather was the clerk, which would now be called an accountant or a bookkeeper. At that time it was called clerk. He was the clerk of the brewery and the place shut down. They needed someone to keep an eye on a plant, keep it operating, keep the power on, keep it from burning down, keep it from being burglarized. So the perfect choice was my grandfather, he moved into his office, turned it into a bedroom complex for his family, and they lived there for 10 or 12 years, I believe. Um, in the meantime, they had uh, several children, my father being one of them, uh, born in the brewery during Prohibition. My father's brother, Paul, who is the arch habit at St. Vincent's, was also born in the brewery during Prohibition. So the family had a lot of physical ties to the place. My dad would often tell the story that the only time he ever had a broken bone in his life was when playing tag with his brother Paul, he fell off an old loading dock at the building. They had 12 children and they, you know, they would always tell us the stories of, you know, when they were young and they were playing, they would play hide and seek among all the tanks and whatnot in the, in the plant itself. Prohibition lost advocates as ignoring the law gained increasing social acceptance and as organized crime violence increased. By 1933, public opposition to Prohibition had become overwhelming. And later that year, Congress ratified the 21st Amendment, making alcohol legal again in the United States. Betting on this repeal of Prohibition in 1933, five brothers from Pittsburgh came to town. These brothers are the Tito brothers. They looked at the plant, they looked at the factory, a brewery that hadn't been used in 10 years, but they saw a character there and they saw opportunity. So they purchased the plant from the Pittsburgh Brewing Company and the Latro Brewing Company was now reformed again under Tito Family Management. And from 1933 to 1939, the Tito Family tried a bunch of different styles, trying to find the beer that's distinctly theirs and to find a beer that the public enjoyed. When the plant was then purchased towards the end of Prohibition by the five Tito brothers from Pittsburgh, um, part of the selling agreement of the building was that Mr. Maher needed to come along with the plant because he was an integral part of the whole operation. In an attempt for the Titter brothers to find a beer that would work for Latrobe, they tried a bunch of different styles. These styles include a lager, a Latrobe ale, a Latrobe old German, a Latrobe pilsner. And all these beers were produced between 1933 and 1939 in an attempt 
to find that perfect recipe in an attempt to find that perfect style that beer lovers and most importantly consumers would latch on to. In 1939, they finally found it. The, uh, of course, when you establish a brand, then you've got to come up with a name for it. You have to come up with a recipe, of course, but then a name and a brand, and a label, and all those things that come together to create your product. Um, when Rolling Rock first started, um, the families all were into horses, all that stuff. So um, they picked a horse to be on their label and there it was, the rolling rock and the, the horse standing there. And uh, they produced some packaging and right away they were getting sued by a whiskey company that claimed that the horse was their label and we couldn't have it. So there was some discussion as to, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do, this and that. And it was agreed to that there wouldn't be any lawsuits if Okay, you quit using this whole entire horse, which uh, they changed it to just the horse head. And that became the logo for years and years and years until they eventually went back and forth with the horse head to the waterfall and to the horse head again. But it was always just the horse head. So when they then began producing beer again, the, the offices that turned into apartments were then turned back into offices again. And I can recall as a child going into my dad's office that he had put shelves up as a kid that he was now using to hold ledgers on. So it's kind of a, an interesting thing, I suppose. Maybe some of the Anheusers or some of the Bushes would have similar stories about buildings like that. but. That's a pretty unique one in my opinion. With Rolling Rock, the Tittos have found it. Rolling Rock would be their cash cow. Rolling Rock would be what they base their business off of. And Rolling Rock would prove later a brewery a success. Mother thought he was spending enough time at the uh, balancing the books at the end of every month. Everything was done by hand back then. It was like you had a calculator and an adding machine, but everything was in pencil and pen. And, ledgers spread all over the place and he would be working on balancing the books and at 9 30 or 10 o'clock at night he there was no secretary to answer the phones and there was no direct lines so she would send me down to the office i would go over to the grating at his window tap on it with a, a piece of gravel from you know the shrubs and he would look wave and i would he would meet me at the door and let me in and i go mom wants you to come home it's 10 o'clock and then he would like pack up and yeah, he would come home <laughs> to get some sleep and then right back at it the next day. Rolling Rock was a success in Western Pennsylvania, but the Tato brothers had a reliance on not advertising. The most advertising done would be going out to a bar and buying a few rounds. Rolling Rock was a very popular regional brand and was very successful in the 50s and the 60s but never went past that. Once the 70s began, production increased. And with that, more employees were hired, and along with those more employees, my father, third generation brewer, Edward Maher. Um, when I first started working at the brewery, when it was, of course, the family owned Rolling Rock local, um, uh, my father being the treasurer of the company at the time, and. We would hire probably hmm, 80 summer workers every year, um, college kids. Um, you, had to, you had to be registered for school because they wanted you for the summer when they wanted all their employees to be able to take their vacation with their families. So people like I would go and work for the summer, filling in for people that then could be away with their families. Uh, but then at the end of summer, I would go away and go back to school. So in 1972, way back in back then, uh, it was my first summer at the brewery. And I was 18 and had a year of school in and, and went off back to school. And then the following summer, you would come back and fill in for those guys again so that they could do their vacations. And also, it was all beer. It was labor intensive back then. So you needed a lot more people to help out. Um, nowadays, you're pushing a button where back then you were 
turning valves and switches and you know hooking up hoses to all kinds of different things all over the building um, so you needed a lot of people around so like I said we had maybe 30 or 40 people in the brewing side where now we might get two in the summer um, the I worked uh, my first four summers at the end of school I stayed on they were hiring people and it was one of the best jobs in town so I was very fortunate to stay there I didn't have to go and look for work it was it was there looking for me sort of um, I brewed beer literally cooked the ingredients for 17 years uh, we worked around the clock back then making rolling rock and rolling rock light it was all three shifts and we switched shifts I worked daylight and midnight and afternoon um, a year after year after year hot as heck in the summer because it was a brew house it was that was the kitchen um, and we had you know it would get up to 105 degrees I mean but that was how it was the cold sections were ice cold hot sections were blazing hot the calendars for the brand which were given out uh, to bars, restaurants, anybody that would want a calendar, the, there was always the winner of the Kentucky Derby was on our calendar. The 1970s were very tough on alcohol. By 1977, the Leitcher Brewing Company was only f one of 40 brewers left in all of the United States. And times were tough. Under Tito ownership, advertising was not done. Advertising was a thing becoming more and more needed. Other brands were advertising on television, at baseball games, had national advertising campaigns. But Rolling Rock still did not. It was assumed that Rolling Rock had the potential to be a national brand, but because of the Tito's stubbornness to advertise, Rolling Rock stayed a regional brand had the possibility at greatness. This possibility was finally met in 1985. In 1985, when so many breweries were closing down, um, or the Rolling Rock brand was lucky enough to have a family of drink products that was interested in um, Jo letting us join that family of products and it was the Sundor brand um, the most famous of their drinks was Sunny Delight which is still for sale another brand that was called Appletice which was very popular at the time but it's faded away um, we were purchased by them and they invested uh, some fresh monies into the brand and proved to buyers that the brand was a marketable product. Sundor owns Latro Brewing Company and owns Rolling Rock for two years. They are running at a deficit, but as stated, proved that there was potential and proved that with additional money put into the company, Rolling Rock could be that national brand speculated on before. I wouldn't call it cheap, I'd call it frugal. Every nickel they spent, they knew where it was going, why, on what the prospects would be of spending that nickel or whatever. Um, they would spend money on sporting event things, sponsorships of things like that. Um, not things like NASCAR or anything, but more localized little things that the name stuck out and mattered. Um, and, um, and just a few years later, the, the Canadian brewer Labatt purchased the whole complex and started dumping cash into the plant. Um, their own a management team and style, uh, new current fast-paced stuff. Um, and the brand turned around and took off and was booming really like never before. And Labatt came to Latrobe. Um, they brought their brewing expertise, their marketing skills, their advertising money, which was millions and millions of dollars, um, to us to help us build. But then they also were able to 
by now having a plant in the United States, had access to all of our distributorships, distributing systems, um, because they were no longer an import, they could like, you know, be brought along with, okay, you're taking 27 cases of Royal Rock and 10 cases of Labatt's this week. And if that's what you were taking, that's what you took. In 1995, Labatt's was then gobbled up by Interbrew, so then that they were no longer in charge of themselves, and that was quite a shock to the Labatt family because they had one brewery in each of the Canadian provinces because that was the law there and then by buying Rolling Rock then they had access to everything in the United States because they weren't an import they were a national brand also so it was quite advantageous to them and then of course they got swallowed up by bigger and then even those people were swallowed up again and again so and in a 10, 12 year period, massive changes took place that no one would have ever expected. In the 80s and the 90s, Rolling Rock finally achieved what was possible this whole time. They finally achieved national brand status. They finally were in a market across this country and across the world. To do this, they tried a few things. First, in 1984, they introduced Rolling Rock Light and Low. They claimed it was the new way to go. The beer was lighter than their popular Rolling Rock Light, but itself was very unpopular and was abandoned several years later. Another way Rolling Rock attempted to appeal was by leaning into the mythos of 33 and creating a mythos around 33. 33 had appeared at the bottom of bottles since 1939 when Rolling Rock was first introduced. This mysterious 33 would have quotations around it, making people think it was important. Above the 33 was the slogan. The slogan reads, Rolling Rock, from the glass-lined tanks of Old Latrobe, we tender this premium beer for your enjoyment as a tribute to your good taste. It comes from the mountain springs to you. That slogan was 33 words. When the designer wrote the slogan on the back of the first label to be sent, to be painted onto the bottle, included the number of words used, and include that number in quotation marks as a 33. The reason being to identify how many words they had chosen, because that would change the cost, and to also add quotation marks to show that this was not important. A mistake had happened, and the 33 was included on the bottles because the Tato brothers weren't necessarily successful in 1939. So they didn't have much money to throw around. And when they were getting their bottles painted on, it would cause all these bottles to have to be destroyed and new bottles to be bought. So they just left it. They left the 33 and they continued with the 33 because it was easier that way. So people came up with theories around 33. And Rolling Rock, strongly in the 90s, leaned into these theories leaned into what people could think and with it a numerous amount of theories popped up it's the number of letters in rolling rocks ingredients the ingredients being water malt rice hops corn and brewer's yeast the theory dictates that the number of letters adds up to 33 the number of letters does indeed add up to 33 but this was not the reason another theory dictates that beer tastes best at 33 degrees and 33 degrees being the actual temperature Rolling Rock was brewed at. This again is not the reason. But these certain theories really don't create a mythos, really don't create a buzz. So some theories were created, some theories were propagated that the 33 could mean something even more mysterious. So the 33 might refer to the highest level status attended by the Freemasons, the famed 33rd degree or other more innocuous things like there's 33 streams feeding to the reservoir from which the brewery draws its water again another coincidence or one of the most common misconceptions referring to 1933 the year prohibition was repealed and the year the Tato brothers started the company all these seem correct and all these add to a mythos that Rolling Rock heavily leaned into 
but 33 was just the amount of words in the back of the bottle. Rolling Rock would lean so hard into this mythos that they would ask people and ask fans to write in what they think it was. And they were giving fans the actual answer by having fans come up with their own answer. They asked fans to write what they think the 33 means using 33 words. Exactly. Having the 33 at the bottom of these postcards with 33 spots for their explanation and they would give a monetary prize to the winner. They were giving away <laughs> the reason for 33. But it still adds to the mythos. And with this mythos, people you thought about Rolling Rock. It was a premium beer. They liked the taste, but you also thought about the 33 and you talked about Rolling Rock. And this helped Rolling Rock grow. This helped Latrobe grow. This helped Rolling Rock find its niche, find its spot, and finally become that national brand that the Tittos and Sundor thought it could be. With this, Rolling Rock had grown, and Latrobe had grown with it. And with this outreach, and with others, Rolling Rock was becoming the identity of Latrobe. People knew Latrobe was where they made Rolling Rock. People from across the country knew Latrobe was where they made Rolling Rock. Rolling Rock, so to speak, puts Latrobe on the map. And Rolling Rock gives back to that community, most specifically in 2000, during the Rolling Rock Town Fair, which went on for a number of years, but most importantly, in 2000 was headlined by then popular Red Hot Chili Peppers. All this work f made Latrobe citizens identify with Rolling Rock, and certainly the ones working for Rolling Rock identify with Rolling Rock. It was their product. It was strictly theirs. And they identified with it and they loved it. They celebrated it by buying merchandise. They celebrated it by telling people all they could about Rolling Rock. And with some of them only exclusively drinking Rolling Rock. But this would come to an end. When in 2004, Latrobe's story follows the story of many other beers that were lost in the 70s. When larger corporations bought up smaller breweries, Rolling Rock would be bought up themselves and leave the trobe forever. Um, when the uh, Rolling Rock brand was sold, uh, it of course was quite a uh, shock to me and to all co-workers and to the entire community actually because um, just like Arnold Palmer and Mr. Rogers, La Trobe was Rolling Rock and of course also St. Vincent's, um, you know, those things you always, around the world people knew La Trobe for. No, um, we found out we were being bought by Anheuser-Busch, which seemed like a wonderful thing until we realized that they were buying our brand, but not our brewery. They were taking the brand and leaving, which is what any normal um, brewer would do that has capacity to fill. We'll buy this brand and we'll make it and we'll keep our own people working. We were lucky enough that at the time, a group uh, called City Brewing, which was G. Heilman originally, um, was looking for um, space capacity. And we were actually, our facility was actually too big for what they were looking for. But they bought it anyway and transformed it, uh, working on getting it up and running again. Uh, we had a contract with Samuel Adams at the time. Um, then Samuel Adams opened up their own building, didn't need us anymore, so the whole thing fell apart uh, within a year and we were unemployed again. Um, the, we were unemployed for almost a year. In the, uh, when we would go to the unemployment office, they wanted us all to you know, go back to school, to learn new trades, to become a bricklayer, a, you know, a cement mason, whatever an accountant, who, who knows what, but you know, you need to get a job. But, and we all kept saying, uh, but our jobs are gonna, uh, we're, we're gonna go back to work. We're all we totally confident that we were, 
would be reopening the plant. That it was a wonderful place. It just needed, you know, needed some tender loving care and you know and something to sell, some brand to make. And the um, as the year rolled on, though, you started thinking, "Who oh boy." Um, well, in my case, uh, I started looking right away because I was a little bit lower on the seniority end than some of the, my co-workers, so I had already used up my unemployment benefits. Uh, the ones that did not, they fell under a different category where they were allowed to keep collecting and take some school classes if they wanted to. So I was pretty well depleted, I was told, in that area, so I went looking for work right away. Um, I mean, you'd always be hopeful. Rolling Rock was in Lake Trobe ever since I was uh, born and way before that. So, uh, you know, I think we were hopeful, but realistically, I, I knew it wasn't, it was probably not going to be back. Because it was kept pretty quiet. Nobody seemed to hear about hear about until all of a sudden this one day, uh, the, the, the owner sold it and we were out of work. It was more than just losing a job. Um, the Rolling Rock itself sort of had a persona of its own, and and to me, I just had the feeling like it was a, a big old funeral. You know, it just seemed like you were, um, you know, losing a great friend and and uh, we're having a funeral. You know, so I mean, it was that was very difficult, and and yeah, um, not knowing what was coming that and having so many people, you know, be off, um, you know, that was very difficult. Um, when, when the brewery closed, um, I actually still worked there for two more months because, uh, based on what your, um, position was, um, like most of the people, you know, were done on the same day. And then, uh, like my, being what my function was, um, you know, it was going to go on a little longer. So I was still there for another two months. So that actually was a little difficult because, you know, Lots of people had lost their jobs. Um, you know, they weren't there anymore. It was just very different. So you know, you were closing down, and uh, that was you know a very sad time. Um, we did know that uh, the city was looking uh, to potentially um, buy it. You know, we knew it'd be totally different and whatnot. Um, so actually, um, I had my last when I had my last day of work. That was on a Friday. On Monday. Um, the city had called a, an, an employee meeting and they announced that they, you know, were signing the papers and that, you know, the deal was going to go through, um, that they were going to buy the brewery. So that was perfect timing for me because it was the end of one and there was, you know, light at the end of the tunnel there. Um, uh, but it was, you know, they had, they had said, you know, like, uh, don't lose your house over this. We don't know how long it's going to be. You know, if you need to, you know, you go somewhere else and work and and uh, start over. You know, um, because you know it was a new business. You don't know how it's going to go for one thing, but it was going to take you know a lot of work and quite some time. So uh, you know, while there was that hope there, you know, it's still uh, it's quite different. And um, the uh, union had a bit of a connection to city you know they if city was going to open they would have like the oppor the first opportunity to be employed there um i really didn't realize at the time we salaried staff sort of thought it was the same for us but it was not um, we had no connection to them and they had no um agreement or whatever to hire anyone back so um you know i was quite fortunate um that uh, I, I was one of the very few people that um, did come back. Um, some of the, the functions that used to be done at La Trobe Brewing Company were not going to be done in La Trobe for City um, because they have the La Crosse, Wisconsin headquarters. Some of those functions, um, like your marketing and sales, that sort of thing, um, those sorts of functions uh, would be handled for Wisconsin. So, you know, there was a less of a need for some of the positions. The City Brewing Group had several different products that uh, we had never made being a brewery. They had iced tea products that they sold. They had uh, soda pops that they would sell. Um, 
boy, wow, lemonade, root beers, um, all kinds of things. To where, you know, when they first opened up, though, none of those were available for us to make because we didn't have the right mixing ingredients. Um, batch equipment. blend system, it's called. We were only able to make beer. <clears throat> so when they opened, we were able to make the uh, Samuel Adams product, which was this big booming company at the time. Of course, it's ten times bigger now than it was then. Um, but they only needed us for a short time, about six months, and then they were leaving to make their own products, and we were left with basically nothing. And we all started to think that, gee, maybe this is it. Maybe we had our last hurrah. If they don't want us, who, who would, you know? And we were down and out for nine or ten months um, while well, everything was being shaken out. Eventually, the Iron City plant in Pittsburgh needed to close. It was a very old building. It actually, Abraham Lincoln was the president when Iron City opened up. So it was an old place. So we were able to contract with Iron City um, to make their products. And that was enough business to reopen our facility for the second time in a couple of years. And we are still making the Iron City products to this day. Um, and the Blockhouse brands, which is their specialty beers that they make, which seems quite popular throughout the year. I think there's five or six different brands they make. With Latrobe looking for a contract and needing one desperately, and Iron City of the Pittsburgh Brewing Company needing a co-packer to produce their beer, a symbiotic relationship was formed. One that echoed a relationship 110 years ago. In 1899, without the Pittsburgh Brewing Company, the Lake Trove facility possibly could have closed and possibly would have never been open to this day. And without the Lake Trove facility being open during this time, Iron City wouldn't be produced. Iron City would be gone to time again, but with this relationship, similar to 110 years ago, Iron City is produced in Latrobe. And with Iron City, being produced in Latrobe, the Pittsburgh Brewing Company stays in business. And with it, the city brewery plant in Latrobe stays in business. Well, mine and I think a lot of other people, we were very upset. And uh, I just, I didn't want to look at a Rolling Rock uh, bottle of beer. I did, you know, wasn't going to drink one. So for several years, I just, I just, you know, just wasn't too happy about the situation. But as time went on, and now that, like I said, what this job here did for my uh, son, uh, was great and um, I kind of am over it. So if you ask me now and you'd want to buy me a Rolling Rock or have one, I said, sure, I'll have one. So, because uh, to me it's still a good beer. Um, I have found that I myself have moved on. Um, uh, I have more or less like, separated from the brand. I mean, I, I would not drink it now because it was taken from us and I don't think it would be as good as what, it, what we had. Um, so that would be one brand no, I would not drink. Um, I have nothing against seeing somebody drink one. I have nothing against anything like that. In fact, my father, um, shortly after the plane closed, we were all going out to dinner and he had a polo type shirt on and it had the Rolling Rock brand on it. And a couple of us were like, Dad, you can't wear that. And he said at the time, they were good to me my entire career for 44 years. They took care of me. I have nothing wrong. I don't feel bad about wearing this shirt. And, and that was fine, you know. But people were coming back to that a bit again, I think. Um, having, you know, Rolling Rock, you know, there, and it was actually sort of a part of your identity, actually. Um, it was interesting because, like, no matter where you went, if you're on vacation somewhere or whatever, I mean, that was always a great conversation starter was to say oh you know I work at Rolling Rock Brewery and yeah right away you were you were friends you know and um, and was always very interesting um, although I have found that now even though it's not Rolling Rock and it's not our brand it's you know co-packing uh, people still think it's interesting when you say you work at a brewery <laughs> so you know we do still have that but uh, yeah that was uh, an identity thing, I would say, you know, everybody did sort of relate to the same thing there, you know. Um, when you 
have uh, contract customers, uh, there it's normally like say a, a smaller beverage company um, that you know they don't have to then invest in the brick and mortar, which is what we have, and. Um, you know, we can bottle, we can can, we can keg, we can brew, we can batch blend. So, you know, we kind of offer it all. A new can line, uh, new uh, pasteurizing systems, uh, the things that, um, more stuff happened in a couple years than it happened in 20 years as far as plant facility operations and things. And, and it, then this next time up and running, we knew we could you make it work and we had enough business and we actually started hiring people. When I first went back to work after being off for a year, there were only seven or eight people there. You know, now there's, I don't know, 150, 160 people working there and, you know, we're making stuff around the clock. I don't even know how many products we make, maybe 30 different things, maybe more than that. Um, so, you know, it's kind of interesting. Every day is different. I don't think I ever have two days in a row the same. Where with Rolling Rock, every day was the same. Everywhere you looked, it was either a green can or a green bottle or a green keg. Now you look down the halls and it's a rainbow of colored cans and bottles.